Hello, this is Justin Ruger with Accessible Beekeeping and More. Today I have my co-host Jonathan and the author of Bee People and the Bugs They Love, Frank the Bee Man. How are you doing today, Frank? I'm doing great, Justin. It's nice to see you and Jonathan. Thank you for having me on your show. Thank you for being here. It's going to be a little bit different or a little hard to follow up after your interview with uh, Frederick Dunn. <laughs> we'll find other stuff to talk about. Like I always say, that's the great thing about beekeepers. Doesn't matter where we are, or what time it is, we'll find something to talk about. <laughs> um, so the first thing I wanted to ask is what was your motivation for writing this book? <clears throat> Good question. It was it was funny. So I I was president of my local bee club for about a decade. And one of the um, ways that I raised money for my club was doing a lot of talks, um, you know, for different groups in the public, like non beekeepers to explain what, what it, we do and why we do it. And with every talk, I would get better in how I would explain things so people could understand what beekeepers look for and all those kind of things. After about literally 125 talks, I'm like, man, how many times can I say it? but I had kind of like polished how to give the explanations. So then I just started writing it down. And then that's kind of how the book came together. You um, got a copy of my book, which I appreciate. And I went through the self pro self published process. Did you do self published or did you go through a publisher? I went through a publisher. So it's uh, like I, I'm in North Jersey and then so I'm somewhat familiar with the publishing industry, which is in New York. And so I just I, I went that route uh, first. And yeah, and your book's great. And I hope everybody that watches your show has a, a copy and will also pick up the future ones. And I love your illustrations that what um, really, really is what inspired me to get it. Thank you. I appreciate that. So what was the process of um, publishing through a publisher for anybody out there who wants to know and of course myself since i've only researched through google and that's all i know so the the main thing or the first thing that you have to do is you have to find an agent um and then the a literary agent will then pitch your project to uh the different publishing houses and so to get an agent i had to write what's called a query letter to kind of explain so think about this like in in literally one page you can't be longer than one printed page you have to say everything about your book about you and why it should be published <laughs> so how do you boil it down to that and then um you also have to put together a book proposal and um so it it like to write the query letter you know took me um probably about a month and then i just had to do my research and, and target agents that specialized in nonfiction. And then also that seemed like somebody I wanted to work with. That sounds exciting. Um, one of the things that we do on this channel is try to be inclusive with beekeeping and work with um, beekeepers that are disabled or have limitations. Have you received any feedback from your book about how influential it's been to all types of beekeepers, whether they are, especially any that have limitations? I, I've heard from a lot of beekeepers just how much they enjoyed it in the stories, because it seems like what I keep hearing is the characters that I wrote about, you know, because they could be, they seem to be universal and people can identify um, with them either because they know somebody in the club or they've met somebody that's like one of the characters in the book. <clears throat> Um, have you yourself as the president or a uh, member of your association had a chance to work with a beekeeper that has a disability or limitation? The, um, that's a good question. I, the, the, in our club active for um, he's, he's in his nineties and he still keeps bees. There's, I, in, there's a chapter in my book, it's called the one eyed beekeeper. Um, so he um, has, has limited sight and has for most of his life and yet has kept bees, I want to say, for probably over 70 years at this point. And he's still doing that? 
yeah last last i heard he uh, he was and um yeah like i said there's a whole chapter in the book and it talks about a lot of the other things that he does he's a little bit of a character so he's um so i i don't want to hold him up as a role model but just more as a point of interest um because <laughs> He's kind of a showman. Let's put it that way. It seems like a lot of the people in your book were showmen. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think it's, I mean, we're all beekeepers here, right? We like to talk about bees and, and laugh about all our funny stories. Um, but in addition, I would say in the club that we do have um, a, a lot of beekeepers that are older. And so their limitations are the being able to lift the hives. And then so, what I was president would be to, to, to pair them with a younger person that's just trying to get into the hobby. So then that way the younger person can learn from the more experienced guy, the more experienced guy then can benefit by having somebody do the labor that they, they might be struggling with. Okay. So my mother and I, when we were driving to Dallas, Texas, she we got your book on audible and she was laughing the whole way. She, <laughs> she loves your book, and she made it a point to tell me that I had to let you know. Um, one question we had was we, as our, personally, the profile that we have would be cowboys. <laughs> what pro- <laughs> I mean, we run out there, you know, no, no uh, protective garb on, barely using smokers. <laughs> <laughs> what is your what profile do you think fits you that's a good question so and for those the, what i did is i i said like there's the cowboys are somebody that don't necessarily have a plan they just kind of go out to the bee yard um they they might not have brought their smoker or, or all the tools and everything they need They they you know might not wear protection and stuff like that and then on the other extreme is the surgeons and the surgeons are who like to wear be covered from head to toe. So no part of them is exposed to the bees. And um, I think that they got into beekeeping because they like to play dress up. They probably played uh, you know, when they were kids, they got all the, the superhero costumes. And so this is their beekeeping costume. And then they're very precise and they, they have everything laid out and usually a lot of gadgets and stuff like that. So I, I would say um, I, I am wearing less and less protection as I've gotten into it. So like right now there's um, I wear just a thing over my face and it's mostly because um, I swell up. And when I swell up, I look like Avatar, you know, the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and since I, I have a, a non beekeeping job, I, I can't look like I was in a fight um, every Monday because I swollen with bee stings. So I, I wear just that. And then I wear nitrile gloves Um so I and that's because they're easy to take off the gloves and as that sticky as it gets in the hive. So I'm, I wouldn't I wouldn't call myself a cowboy because I always try to in my head have a reason to go in each hive. But I, I clearly don't wear a lot of stuff. So one of the amazing stories that you tell is how the badger got you started in beekeeping. What did you take from him and what did you decide that maybe you shouldn't follow those instructions? <laughs> yeah. I, I guess do, do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I, and I still am appreciative of the badger. It's because of him of why I'm a beekeeper and why we're talking today. Um, so I think what I took from him is the enthusiasm for, for beekeeping and then just the ability to meet other people from, you know, these honey loving bugs. And I, and the things that, um, that I do differently is he was a hardcore cowboy and especially to be mentoring a new person such as myself at the time, he didn't provide me with a lot of good steps. So I have always tried because of issues that I faced that as, you know, in the president of the club to make it an environment where, new people could learn easily. If somebody wanted to buy your book, but was not sure, what would you say to recommend that they go ahead and purchase it? Well, I would say that the, 
what I well what I tried to do with my book is I tried to tell funny stories, you know. So it's in in what I've done is like it's a good place to learn about beekeeping because I kind of hide all the science and the facts in some funny stories. So if you're just kind of if you're if you're just curious about bees, you're not even sure if you want to do it, or you're just like, hey, I've read a bunch of how to beekeeping books. You're gonna like you're gonna laugh and you're gonna have some some stories you can relate to. Um, one of the issues my mother and I had when we started beekeeping was find a good local association to join. Um, do you believe that associations, especially for somebody with limitations, is an important part of their success? I do. I think that, and the reason I say that is that you know, it, it's interesting how many I've already brought up twice, but how many older people are in beekeeping, which I think there might be something in bee venom that makes uh, it's kind of like the fountain of youth. Um, but there's so much experience of just being in the hive that finding people that are going to share that with you is invaluable. And then on the other side is I think, you know, in this day and age, too many people look to YouTube for advice and there's anybody can make a YouTube channel about bees many of which aren't based in science. And that's why I think it's important to find an association and or a mentor and or a group that will not just give you, um, you know, myths and, and old wives tales about bees, but actually have it based in science. What is your, um, sorry, when you, when you wrote your book, was there any books out there that were motivational to you? And what books would you recommend for somebody that had disabilities that was interested in learning more about beekeeping? Yeah, there was there was a whole bunch of books. I'm I, I'm a self-professed bee nerd. And that's like I always say with beekeeping, there's two sides to it. There's the get off your couch and you got to get into the hive, a practical side. And then there's this whole nerd side because honeybees are one of the most studied creatures on the planet. And so because of that, there's tons and tons of scientific articles that come out every year, as well as, as countless books. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting if you think about it, that, you know, Reverend Langstroth, who discovered the modern hive because of bee space, wrote his book in the late 1800s. And that's still published today. And it's still pertinent today. But then even having a book that's, you know, 150 years old, you still have bee books that come out every single year. Um, so... The one of the books that I like, and Jonathan, since you said you're from Missouri, which we found out we have that in common, that mm -hmm. one of the books that I really liked when I read early on was um, uh, it's called A Bee by Sue Hubble. Um, and Sue Hubble wrote this book, I want to say in the 80s, and mm -hmm. she was a beekeeper in the Ozarks, just south of Springfield. Mm -hmm. So her book is. Um, as much about beekeeping and she uses a calendar year as the way that she gets through the books. So and that way she's saying what beekeepers do throughout the different seasons, but she also describes um, the Ozarks and how pretty it is. Mm -hmm. And then just um, being out in nature as she has eyes. So it's, it's really, it's a beautifully written book. Um, so that's, that was one that I really, really enjoyed. Um, one of my favorite books is, um, um, Bees in America, How the Honeybee Shaped a Nation by Tammy Horn. And that's great because she takes you chronologically from when the European settlers first came over and they brought honeybees with them all the way through to the present. And as some people might not realize, honeybees aren't native to North America. So it was the colonists that brought the bees over on the ships. And uh, that book's great because it just... it shows you when different um, inventions and in and, and just things were discovered here in the US you know um, that have now are still impacting modern beekeeping yes it was very those are um, some of those books I have not read some that are definitely ones that I need to read um, so this is a hard interview to follow up especially since Frederick Dunn got to you first, 
but um, my mother and I watched your interview and you talked about education for younger children. One of the things that I do since I have a children's book is go and talk to homeschool co-ops, um, Girl Scout troops and schools about honeybees. You, you give a lot of talks to kids as well, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and that's one of the things I love about your book is that to me, a kid, a child is not naturally afraid of bees or anything in nature. And so if a kid develops a fear, it's because of what the, the grownups around them are saying. And your book is so accessible and makes it an exciting journey to take Henry into the hive. And I think that that's going to do wonders to get kids to, to get that spark. So then they get excited about it. And then we have future beekeepers. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about the reviews that we've gotten so far. And the next two books come out Mother's Day, um, teaching about beekeeping. And they kind of follow the same lesson from Honey. Um, but one question I had was, if you if someone out there wants to go teach children, they're obviously different than giving a talk uh, to adults. What do you recommend they do to get on the children's level? Yeah, I, uh, I think it's important to make sure that you're not using beekeeper lingo because we have all, you know, <laughs> nuke, frame, super, deep, you know, that, that means nothing to non-beekeeper, especially a kid. So to use words and examples that they can relate to, um, like one, one of the things that I always like to do um, is when I'm describing that bees do the waggle dance to give directions to food source that wherever I am, I try to think of something that's about, you know, three miles away. And so as opposed to saying flowers, I'll say like, it was funny that before when Toys R Us was still around. So before they went out of business, I used to say, you know, the Toys on Us on, you know, blah, blah, blah. And all the kids are like, yeah. I said, so imagine doing a dance to get everybody in this classroom to know how to get to that Toys R Us. And it was funny then when when it went bankrupt that I was still using that as an example in the classroom. Like, you know, Toys R Us? And they're all like, it went out of business. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I love about talking to kids is because there's some of the funny stuff that they say, you know. So use different term terminology. Yes. And things that the kids can relate to. And, and relatability. Like sure. Yes. And then a lot of show and tell. So I, I, I have an observation hive that I put two frames of bees inside. They can't get out. And then the kids just love that. And then I, you know, I bring, I have a demo hive just empty, but just to show the different pieces and, and then just being able for the kids to see it and then sometimes touch it is good. It's funny. I used to bring pieces of wax for the kids to actually pass around until this one time it comes back to me and the kid goes, it's flat. <laughs> I smushed it so i'm like yeah i'm not gonna pass wax around anymore <laughs> yeah we learned that the hard way we went to the girl scout troop and i have finger holes all in the wax oh uh, yeah hmm. but there's some um uh there's some good uh photos that, that are the size of frames so you can pop them into the wood frames to show um and it's actually the they're photos taken by a French photographer who do, has done it's a beautiful um, coffee table book. I'm blanking on the name, but it's all photos of bees from uh, around the world. And actually, the publisher for that is in Missouri. Really? Yes. He wrote it in French. And then, again, I apologize for Oh, blanking, yeah. But Got in they, Gainesville. they train, translated it. So now... Uh -huh. Yeah, but so they're the the publisher, that, and that's it's a beautiful book. And that same photographer has the um, the bee teaching um, frames that I'm pretty sure Man Lake sells. Mm -hmm. Another part from the interview, um, you mentioned that the book sales benefited your association. Is that correct? That the, my bee talks. Um, your bee benefit. talks. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah, so what I would do is as I you know when my club started. It was pretty small, um, and it sounds like you had said when you and your mom started, you didn't get a lot of help, and that's kind of how I felt 
that when my I first joined my club, there was a lot of people that weren't helpful and looked at you cross-eyed. And so when I became president, I wanted to, to build a, a more of a teaching uh, organization. And to do that, I needed to have funds and then members. And so I would do all these talks. And then, then at the honorarium, I had to make the checks out directly to the B club. And I said, look, I'm volunteering my time, but I need you to make a donation to my, to my club. And that's how we were able to raise the money so that we can do more things and bring in speakers and all that kind of good stuff. One of the things that we're trying to do with accessible beekeeping and more is actually survey United States beekeepers uh, to kind of get an idea of what the number or percentage of our subjects, and I hate saying the word subjects, but what number of them identify as having a disability. How can we get associations involved in uh, distributing the survey? My, my recommendation would be that, you know, Facebook has so many different beekeeping groups and that once you have the survey up and it's, and it's a link is to just go all over into all those different sites and say, Hey, you know, we're, we're doing this survey. If, if you could please take three minutes to answer it and then just every, and please, please share. And then the more places you post it and the more people that share it, the more it'll go around. So that would be my number one um, recommendation. My second would be to reach out to some of the regional B groups like EAS. And then, um, and I'm sure that they would get it out to their members. And then it's going to have a, you know, a cascading effect, you know, you get it to EAS and then it goes to the presidents of the States. And then from there, it just kind of keeps going. Okay. One other idea too, is reach out to be informed part uh, partnership at a university of Maryland because they, they already do a lot of surveys for B law. So maybe they'd want to help you get in the word out about your survey as well. And who is that again? Be informed partnership. So they do a lot of the uh, might surveys that go out in uh, like August, April. September. Are they the ones that do the uh, colony loss survey that just came out in April? They, I think so. Yes. And that's, that's out of the University of Maryland, uh, Dennis Van Engelthorpe's lab. And uh, Dennis Van Engelthorpe is the one who actually came up with the term colony collapse disorder. I learned something new every time I talk to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you working on now? What is your, I know you stepped down as a leadership role from your association. So what, what keeps uh, Frank the Bee Man busy? Yeah, I do. I'm doing a lot more in my town. Um, I just, I'm really, it's a real bee friendly uh, village. And so like I'm on the board for the Parks and Rec and I'm teaching um, a beekeeping class here. And then also I have um, hives on town property. And so what we're going to do this summer is do what I call hive dives or for a day that people can sign up through the town and come out and, uh, and check out the hives. So that's amazing. Well, what, what got you started into all this, the, the volunteering your time and the sharing your love of beekeeping. I mean, we know from the book and whoever reads it will know what got you into beekeeping, but what pushed you to further your um, volunteering and your time to dedicate to beekeeping? I I have three children and I believe it's important to set a good example. And so I'd rather lead by showing them how it's important to give back to your community and to causes that you believe in. Um, I think, you know, it's too often people sit there on the couch and they scream at the TV about things they don't like. And it's up to everybody, either you know, as small or as big as you want to be to get involved, to make the change. And, and one of the other things I did for my town, which I'd recommend, is um, my town was the first Bee City USA in the state of New Jersey. And Bee City USA is, um, it. most people are familiar with Tree City. So this is kind of a similar organization, but for pollinators. And you can get your uh, municipality certified. And it, it's a good way to educate 
the, the, the residents about the importance of all pollinators, not just honeybees, and then set up programs to make a greener area. So that's Bee City USA, which I, I am a big proponent of as well. Other than joining an association, um, we've talked a lot about your book and your what you're doing from here on out. If somebody has a limitation, such as being in a wheelchair like Jonathan and I, or um, blindness like Ariel Gilbert, what would you recommend they do to be successful at beekeeping? Um, yeah, I, 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 what I. I would say it this way is that I think that it's interesting how people from all different interests get into beekeeping. So there's a lot of people that are very handy. I am not one of those people. Um, so it seems to me that if you talked with somebody that's like a good carpenter and said, Hey, you know, uh, I really need blank or it'd be really helpful if there's blank, then I'll bet you that there's somebody, a beekeeper around that could help build that. Um, you know, and that's how innovation happens, right? Need, need promotes innovation. So that would be number one. And number two is I, I would, I, I would make sure to try different types of hives or, or, or other things, you know, it's, um, you know, like there's the top bar hive is one where, you know, it, because it's, it's horizontal as opposed to vertical might help because then you can limit the, the height, right? And then there's other types of equipment that you could use, like it, University of Guelph in, in Guelph, Ontario, has a lot of great YouTubes that they put out. And one of the most simple things that I saw is that, um, and I use this in my own uh, beekeeping now, is he brings a portable bench that he puts by the hive. So then that way you're just sliding the boxes right onto the bench as opposed to having to pick them up and then bend over to put them on the ground and then pick them back up again. So just by having things like that, you know, um, can save, can save your back and, and clearly would make it easier, more accessible by, by controlling the movements, you know? That was a good point that you made. What else have you changed from when you started beekeeping to now, such as adding that portable bench do you think might be beneficial to somebody who is struggling with the weight of Linkstroth hives? Is there anything else other than just that portable bench that you have added to your regimen? Well, I think it's, it's controlling the, like there's ways to control height, right? So it's, you know, meaning that, you know, how many cinder blocks do you have it on or what type of um, bent or stand do you use? So like one of the things you know, you know, you're always, all the books always show you put, put a couple of cinder blocks under it. But what I actually have on top of my cinder blocks is um, it, it's a two foot by two foot piece of slate. And then I put the hive all the way to one side. So it gives me a little bit of a shelf. So right at my hive, I can, I can sit my smoker or my, um, you know, I use one of those uh, frame hangers that go on the side of the hive um, and just all that stuff. So again, you know, if you have everything that you need or most of what you need right there, then you're not having to, to move to go get something to come back to the bees, you know? And I would say the other thing I have is I have a, a dedicated bee box um, that I have all my stuff in because what one of my big things, um, so maybe I was more like a cowboy when I started, was I'd, <clears throat> I'd go out to my hives and I'd forget something. I have to go back and get it and bring it back. And so after a while, I had just a bucket where I just threw everything in my bucket so I would remember it. But now I've upgraded to a box. And I think that if you have some sort of container where you have everything you're going to need, then it, you bring it from your house to the bees, then it's there. Then if you have like a shelf of some port, some sort, then it's even closer to the bees, you know? So be prepared, basically. Be prepared, yeah. And I have seen, like, there's there are, like, you know, I, I've seen other products that are always coming out. Like, if you've seen, like, there's a new thing, it looks like almost um, you slide it between the Langstroth boxes, and then they inflate, so you can kind of put the top box up, and it won't have to lift it, so you can get in there um, 
to do, I guess, for medication and things like that. So that's another thought too. I have not seen that. I'll have to look for that. I haven't seen anything like that either. I want to say I saw an ad for it in B culture, hmm. but it's like, they're like two little squares that you put in under the corners and then in, they inflate and then that's how it'll push it up. Hmm. <clears throat> do you have anything, Jonathan? No, I don't believe so. Well, I know that we very much appreciate you coming on. Um, is there anything else that you would like to say about your book, about your work with um, children or adults? Um, I, I just, I think what I'd like to say is that if you think about it here, here are three guys that have never met, but we just had a great conversation all because of a bug. And that's one of the hmm. things I love about the beekeeping community. You know, it's like, as I've traveled nationally and internationally, just, it's like this, I call it, it's like an international fraternity. And then, you know, you can, you have a friend wherever you go and it doesn't matter you know, what you do for a living or where you come from, because all that matters is the bees. And I love the way that we can just get together and talk and nothing else matters. It's just, Hey, you know, let's look at, look at that queen. How much honey you getting? What are your mite treatments? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on. Well, thanks again for having me. And uh, I hope you and your bees do great this season. So thank you. Yes. Likewise. So everyone, thank you for listening to Frank the Bee Man, the author of Bee People and the Bugs They Love. Uh, remember, be different, be limitless, and continue beekeeping.